and feel free to talk too. I mean, you don't have to sit on mute. Uh, anyways, today we are starting off, as I'm sure you're aware, with a a uh, environment or background basic rundown. Uh, so essentially. The first thing you usually want to start with is what do you want your composition to be like? Um, do you want to have a deep depth of space? What's the scale of everything compared to the foreground and middle ground and background? Uh, so what are those relationships in that uh, area of space and the plane you're looking at? Um, so these are just some examples I pulled up. Uh, this one's got some going on. I don't know what's going on with it. but. As you can see, the one thing that all of these seem to have is, uh, well, first off, there's value in them. So value can help bring forward or push back something, um, and that's a really effective tool to try and do or generate a feeling of space. Um, you can have foreground, middle ground, and background elements. It's actually normally recommended that you have a foreground, middle ground, and background since it sets up kind of a relationship of scale between each item that you're looking at in that piece. Um, so for example, we have the foreground, uh, which is these. Uh, then we have kind of this middle ground, and then we have a nice movement from these brush strokes across this path. And then these kind of get lighter and less detailed as you go back. Um, so detail and texture also play a big part in it, since um, the closer you are, obviously, the more detail you can see, but as you get further back, the less detail you can see. So again, that's back into get your value down, get your uh, get get what you have down, add value, then you want to work into texture. Because if you start out rendering all these back things, you're going to spend a lot of time there, you're going to waste a lot of uh, time that you could have spent working on these areas, per se. Um, this is kind of more of like a compressed space, since this is another still life I did in my Draw 100 class. Uh, so you could probably tell that these two things are probably pretty close to the viewer, um, considering this has, you, you can see like all the little divots and highlights going off of it, whereas the rabbit I mean, there's probably a little bit more detail in it since it's about mid-ground, I'd say. Uh, but you can see the varying differences of detail as you go back in space. So, for example, you can't see every every ridge or shadow in the molars, um, but you could if it was here instead. Um, another example, uh, this is more for like a perspective thing. I will admit this one was a tad rushed. Um, but another good thing is to familiarize yourself with um, kind of just the basics of perspective. So one point, two point, uh, maybe even three point if you want to get super nitty gritty with it. Um, and you can see how value kind of differentiates all these different corners from each other. Uh, you have these foreground things which are super detailed up close. Um, and then you can have like a less detailed fish, this isn't super detailed, this isn't, that's a little bit more detailed. Um, so it's just about finding the different kind of relationships between the shapes and their relativity in the space. Um, I'm not going to do a rundown on perspective because that, that's a whole other can of worms, uh, but we can, we can do that later. Um, another good thing to take into account is atmospheric perspective. Um, so that's kind of along the lines of the more upfront it is, the closer it is to a viewer, uh, the more detailed it will be. Uh, so atmospheric perspective is as you move back, it gets less saturated. Um, so that's it, it's not a super great example. I did this in high school, but um, you can see like this tree up front is more detailed, um, and then as you move back, they get into kind of these lighter um, hue or lighter values, and, and then it goes into a, just essentially a white background tree. Um, so those are all important uh, to take into perspective. Um, if you don't have something 
super hard set, like a perspective grid, um, which you can use in uh, things that don't have hard lines in them, uh, kind of like this, um, is try and figure out where you want your figure. Um, so for example, I knew I wanted my figure to be in the center, uh, which is probably bad composition practice, but that's beside the point. Um, <clears throat> and I knew that I kind of wanted her framed. Uh, so I tried to use these mountains to frame her, and then I tried to make her scale more of a mid-ground scale compared to a foreground scale. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this uh, so I can actually find my other tabs. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that's the basics. Um, you can also do try a mix of different elements. So for example, we have the hard set. This is a perspective grid kind of thing. So this walkway here. And then you can see that I kind of try and use um, the scale and proportion of the characters to try and create a sense of space. Um, so for example, uh, Tal's character, which is this black uh, space crew crewmate, um, he's much larger, so you can't see his feet, and he takes up, you know, like a, essentially an entire third of this uh, area. And then this next character, which is Annie's character, you can see his entire body, and including the the hat. So. Uh, that's a way to set up. You can also set up proportions using your perspective grid. Um, I'm not going to go into that because I actually haven't learned that yet, but I will later. Um, so I can go over that later if you'd like, but um, try and figure out relationships of characters to even other characters if you're not going to do like a super detailed this type of background, or if you have multiple characters like in this. Um, so like another example, um, you can see that uh, Red's character, or Blue in this case, uh, he's, he's a lot bigger, so that gives us a sense that he's closer to us, the viewer, and then these guys are all smaller, which tells us he's, he's closer to us and they're further away. Um, and then uh, there's kind of the floor, so again, that's a perspective grid kind of thing, uh, useful to learn. Uh, I'm going to close this one, and I'm going to close this one. Uh, another example, uh, so this is kind of getting a little bit more into composition. Um, so basic good composition is um, you'll have like a kind of grid, so if I try to transform this, maybe, is there a way, oh great, uh, rule of thirds, no. Uh, that's interesting. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, so if you see, there's there's like nine boxes, and they're split evenly across the piece. Um, so usually it's a good rule of thumb to try and keep kind of. Uh, Two thirds taken up and one third to breathe. Um, it's another good idea to have um, focal points on where these intersections are. Um, and then I'm I'm horrible at composition. <laughs> uh, leading lines help. So if you put at a diagonal, that can give a different interpretation of the piece compared to if it was just horizontal. So if I I try and do kind of like that. That changes how this piece feels a little bit. Um, let me see if I can open uh, another version of it while it's open. So composition plays a lot into how a piece can be received. So if I split screen this a little bit, oh boy. Uh, so with this being flat, or uh, more like straight back, so the perspective line would be kind of going like this and less tilted, um, 
I feel like it gives a, a less intense feel. Um, this is kind of like a Dutch angle, um, so it's tilted a little bit. Uh, so by adding that little bit of a Dutch angle, it tilts it in an unsettling way. Um, in composition, there's there's uh, a fair amount of rolls. I'll probably post them later in the server. Um, but uh, the way you angle things can also create kind of this sort of tension. Um, another way to create tension is if I go back to Photoshop. Um, let me open another project. Uh, is you can add these really heavy things on the top to create a kind of sense of dread because when we break um, the set rules of, of like composition, it can create a kind of unease or dislike. Um, and good artists will, will use that and actively think about it as they go through um, their, their pieces. Uh, so for example, if I pull this one up, uh, this was a design project where we had to use ink. Um, I think I showed this last time uh, for value. But we have this really, really heavy scythe that's hanging up on the top part of the canvas. And then we have um, a not as visually weighty and usually lighter object down here. So by having this very detail-heavy and dangerous and sharp and heavy object at the top, it 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 can unsettle the viewer. Um, I probably didn't do the best job of it here, uh, since I'm not. Oh boy, the stream stopped. Uh, okay, let's let's uh, attempt number two. Screen, please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, top heavy thing unsettling um there's there's quite a few artists that are out there that do that well um again limiting to just like one third um l compositions l compositions are really strong too uh it's just it, there's just the way it's laid is always pretty pleasing to to the eye so for example if i pull up my paintings um is a horrible picture but I really sat and thought about the composition uh, so if I pull out this you can really uh, see that so these are kind of this is one third line this is the second third line and then the crossers would be about there let me just crop it uh, show us the grid all right uh, so it, this has that L composition and um, by creating a weight on one side, so like this right side and the bottom, it creates kind of like this niceness to it. Um, and then again, the scale, um, so the glasses are really large. Um, this part's definitely more detailed because it's closer. You can see the straps and um, the clippy clasp things versus kind of like a less detailed, um, simpler, just value piece. Uh, and then again, uh, this focal point area here, it's on this thing, which I actually tried to really hard to make sure it was. Um, and it's, it's always a good rule of thumb where if you have multiple things in a piece, odd numbers are usually more generally well received. Um, so you have your two items grouped together and then you have one off to the side. Um, and that can also kind of create a nice movement along with uh, any additional leading lines and stuff you added. Um, that is something else I was working on earlier today. Uh, so for a basic demo, let me pull out some brushes. Um, so let's say we're doing like, um, you, you mentioned clouds. Uh, so if I... I bucket in a not that dark. Uh, not, oh, it's, it's in black and white. Of course it is. Okay, so if we have kind of like this, this dark midnight background, um, 
An interesting character composition would be if we had, uh, that's the same color, let's go black. Uh, let's say we have like this kind of island here. So this would be like our foreground element. Uh, and if we wanted, we could also add like a little lighthouse. Uh, if I make that smaller. So let's say we have our lighthouse and then a mid-ground element could be, uh, let's say there's an ocean here. So you have like the splashing of waves. Um, and then as you go further out, if we add a layer behind this, uh, we can have more of that. I don't know what layer that was on. Let's get rid of you. Oh boy. Eraser. Go back to normal. So if we erase that, all right, go back to this. Uh, another thing we can do is we can gradiate this. Uh, so if I have kind of kind of like that thing going on, so this being the horizon line. Uh, I'm just gonna clipping mask and gradient tool. Other way. No, other way. Yeah, that way. Um, so let's say this is kind of our background. Um, so we have this kind of foreground element. Uh, and this foreground element we could work into and we could kind of uh, add in some like darker green. So let's say this is like a grassy cliffside. And then since we're so close to it, what you can do is you could go and work in, uh, that's too bright, let me just change my brush. Um, and as you can see, I have a lot of brushes, um, and I do have some that I bought like just yesterday, uh, but don't worry about, I'm, I'm going to assume you're going to get into digital sometime. Um, don't be worried about having the tip top art tools because um, in all honesty you can have the best tools in the world and still make bad stuff. Um, it's not about how expensive or, or hoity-toity your tools are, it's, it's about how you use them. Um, and if you learn how to use them well, that is not what I wanted. Um, you can create great things, even with budget stuff. Um, it's just about figuring out what works with your workflow and how to use it to your advantage. Um, so like, I don't actually know how to use any of these brushes I'm using right now. <laughs> um, but, all right, uh, fast forward. All right, we got the cliff in. Super down and dirty. It's great. Um, Another thing you can do is, since this is so close to us, uh, what we can do is we can add texture. So texture brushes in, oh boy, in digital art uh, will be your friend because they make your life so much easier. So like, let's say I wanted, it's somewhere around here. No, it's up. Okay. So let's say I wanted to do like a... Uh, like a leafy kind of thing. Uh, so you can have pattern brushes, um, but don't don't rely really heavily on them. Use them sparingly, because um, the more detail you add, if that detail isn't correct, the more it's noticeable, if that makes sense. And then that goes back into the make sure you have a good base work before you start working into all these like textures and things. Um, but, you know, you can, you can just kind of blend that out after, and then look at that, you have leaf texture, or grass texture, depending on which way you, you uh, put it. Um, I swear to God, stream. Alright, uh, the stream is very unhappy today. Okay, uh, 
So, uh, I don't know if you saw it, but leafy texture. Uh, also, kind of just like uh, chalk brushes are a good thing to use if you have uh, chalk brushes available to you. Um, they get some nice texture down real fast. Um, and then whenever you're working in like hard lined objects, uh, work in a hard brush. Don't don't go in with uh, like let's see. So some people you'll see like work in like this. Um, now soft brushes do work well, but in moderation. Cause if you make everything soft, it's gonna look very muddy and kind of eh. Uh, so variance in texture is your friend. Uh, don't overdo it on the texture brushes and soft brushes just use for like gradients or or soft things so like um, skin or um, Like I, I don't I like clouds uh, <laughs> So going on that tangent uh, you wanted to cloud um I don't know any of these brushes. This is horrible. Uh, let's try this. Uh, so clouds are an interesting little giblet. Uh, that is not. That's why. Um, so clouds, uh, it's possible to start with kind of like a, just a hard brush. Uh, no, why is that eraser? There we go. Uh, so clouds, um, kind of like, just, just, just slap them in. It's like Bob Ross style. Just go for it. Um, so we have kind of like a cloudy, cloudy giblet here. That is not what I wanted. Uh, so if we think about it, clouds are usually in the background, so they're not going to be like super duper detailed. That's a clipping layer. That is also... All right, stop it. <laughs> uh, that is not the right thing either. Okay, so you just slap your clouds in, uh, and there's there's a lot of different ways to do it. Some artists like to kind of build up the white first, uh, slowly through non-opaque layers. Um, the way I like to work, I just say slap them in, go for it, um, and then after that, what you can do is you can work in. With kind of like a, a softer brush, um, you just gotta soften them, uh, and and don't worry about losing that, cause it's it's like a push and pull, um, you know. Uh, get a basic shape down, kind of kind of smooth it out a little bit. Um, I like using textured brushes for clouds since they are kind of just nebulous little pillows floating in the world. Um, and kind of just, just drag lines through it. That's what I like doing. Um, make sure the stream's still working. All right. Um, so you kind of get your, your cloud base layer down. And then after that, um, what I really like doing is I actually work, uh, on my clouds with a textured brush afterwards. Um, so kind of like something like that. Uh, that can be a rock texture too, but uh, kind of just add in add in some different color. Uh, so if this is like a nighttime, uh, you can kind of add in some some dark purples. Uh, get get some color influence in there. You can also go reds, uh, maybe some yellows if it's like sunset. Uh, kind of just work work in some colors and then. Uh, bring it, bring that white back in. Bring in some bright white. Uh, so if like the moon's back here, I'm not gonna draw it in, but say the moon's back here, it's radiating. It's a uh, magical light out. Kind of just, just add in these, these softness, and then after that, what you can do is you can work back into uh, kind of these areas and kind of like smooth them together. Um, now, I'm not super, super great at Photoshop, um, but if we would like another example, let me switch the, uh, the stream to SAI so we don't crash it. 
hopefully uh paint tool sai sai okay so if i go to this uh no i don't want to save that sure eight by ten uh rotate uh so let's let's get that super simple scene back in all right so we got we got our black f uh it's not what i want uh so we got that kind of black foreground in. And and when you're blocking, try and use a hard brush, uh, cause that'll set up your shapes a lot faster. So if I start with like this airbrush, I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna keep going back and forth. And then you're you're probably gonna have to work into an eraser and it's just gonna take longer. So just just save yourself some time, uh, assuming you're doing digital, uh, with that hard brush. Don't don't be afraid of Mr. Hard Brush. He's your friend. Um, oh boy. Uh, so if we do this and then just kind of quickly slap that in. That looks like a mushroom. It's fine. <laughs> If we get our like kind of murky water splashing up here, and then if we slap a thing in the back like the ocean, that is, uh, and then if we gradiate it, uh, and each program works differently. Um, I, I talk a lot about Paint Tool SAI. Um, I obviously own Photoshop, and I'm not very, I, I don't really like it, but I like the brushes, so I'm kind of trying to get used to it. Um, but I like Paint Tool SAI because it, you can see how well it blends. Um, and then if we add uh, the dark background back in, that is super dark. Uh, that blends with this now. Uh, let's make you. Let's make you a brown. There we go. Um, so again, working back into the clouds. Uh, with Paint Tool SAI, some people like to work just straight onto this. Um, so they'll take uh, like an airbrush or. Um, you can see there's a lot of different brushes. Not as many as I have in Photoshop, but um, there, there's a lot of Paint Tool SAI brushes out there. Uh, so kind of just get your, your basic shape in. Uh, kind of just jiggle it in a little bit. Um, and and there, there are pros and cons of working on one layer like this. Um, So if you kind of get these basic shapes in, um, there's all kinds of clouds too. I'm just going to go in for that cumulus nimbus or big puffy boy look. Um, and then after you get kind of that base work in, uh, sometimes you don't have to blend it. Um, but on Paint Tool SAI, what I like to do is I like to add um, noise is a good one. So noise does that kind of texture. Um, spread is also a good one. It does, it's kind of a similar texture. Um, fuzzy static is also one I've used before, but the problem is, uh, it's probably just this program. You can kind of see grid lines, so I usually choose noise over that. Um, so you can, you can work back in, kind of, kind of, uh, add in that kind of ethereal cloud feel. Um, and then what I like to do is I'll choose like a uh, kind of just like a water brush I like to call it, and I'll also put it on uh, spread or noise or fuzzy static. Um, and uh, sometimes it does funny things. So uh, blending, dilution, and persistence are all something I'd recommend you play with. So just get to know your brushes. Um, and it'll change how thing how it works. So if I switch it to kind of 
kind of like a, a dark purpley color again. You can see it, it, it blends as it goes, kind of. Um, and it's, it, it's useful um, doing that. So some people, uh, especially like more in Photoshop, they'll have kind of these middle tones and they'll just uh, continue like going between them. Uh, and that helps them create nicer gradients. Um, so if I make that dark again, it's kind of just that thing. Um, come in with some white. Um, and just kind of push and pull it, uh, you know, take your time with it, because these things take time. Uh, art is definitely not, not a, a rabbit, a rabbit run. Um, so with clouds, kind of just add in these, these little pockets of stuff, um, if that makes sense. So if I pull up a, kind of like a, a cloud from Google. Um, let's see, what's a good one? So if we, that's the wrong program. Uh, no. So if we slap this in, you can see that it's it's got like these little textures between it, and it's got these different kind of clumps of color. Um, so kind of, kind of just go for that. Um, and push and pull. Uh, so also you can work in different colors together. So you can do kind of like a, a purpley blue, you know. So as it moves up, you can go into the blue section. Um, and just kind of, it, it, it's kind of like a mark making practice too. Because um, if you look at a cloud, you you can kind of notice different patterns on it. Um, so. Uh, you can also do that notan practice I talked about uh, and just get like the basic shapes down and then kind of just work in some middle tones between them. Uh, that works too. Um, but it's, it's just getting practice down, uh, learning to do it um, with brushes. Uh, traditionally, um, I'd say it depends on what medium you're working on. Um, but again, use your brushes to your advantage. You can also use um, non-traditional material, so you can like crumple up a piece of paper and like dab it on. Uh, that works too, and just use it to like dab different colors on. Um, graphite uh, kneaded eraser to lift it up. Um, I would recommend actually investing in a kneaded eraser if you are working like graphite traditionally or pastels even. Um, and just kind of work like take these take these little areas one at a time. Um, don't don't rush it. Um, so if I kind of work that in. Um, also digitally, if you can, uh, flipping your canvas can help you uh, kind of see things, and it does a kind of funny dance. <laughs> but uh, brush settings. Uh, mark making, studying, uh, these kinds of things, um, and just and just putting time into brush hours, because um, brush hours will take you the furthest, or just just working hours uh, of studying and just uh, practicing these kind of soft skills or skills that you'll develop throughout a career in art. Um, and you know they're they're far cry from clouds, but they, they look closer to a cloud than they did before. Um, and and uh, as you can see, texture brushes helped a lot because if I was going into this and I was trying to like hard brush it, it it's definitely doable. Um, it'll just take you more time. So if I try and do this, and I'm just like, uh, let's blend it. Um, and it's it speeds up the process. Um, and don't be afraid to use like different types of layers. So if I add another layer, clipping group this, which isn't necessary, but I can do like overlay. And I can say, what if I bring in kind of this 
this teal color, all right? So then what if I, I lightly add that here? Um, and then if I kind of blend that out, then you get a really fast, nice gradient. Um, and that also speeds up things. Um, so experimenting with different color layers helps too. Um, like if I pull up an example, um, I showed some in the, the last one, but if I, if I switch this back to a uh, screen share and the full screen, uh, just like a little quick thing, if I open, uh, kind of one of these little, little things I worked on. Um, so if I were to take off, uh, so if you look down where my cursor is, this says color dodge. So if I changed, uh, this is what the, the colors were normally, uh, if I didn't have color dodge. Uh, so if I go to dissolve, it does different things. Um, so if you just scroll through these, you'll see they each do kind of their, their own thing. Um, Photoshop is known for it, for having the most, um, since it's Photoshop. <laughs> uh, so just, just play around with different layer types, different brushes. That was kind of an interesting little thing. Um, and they, these will help speed up your process as you work through things. Like, for example, if I, oh no, uh, if I scroll in here, um, you can see that this is like a feather texture, which is auto-generated by a brush. And if I tried replicating this by hand, I would probably chop my hand off before then because uh, that would take me much longer than I want. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a down and dirty, quick, fast environments. Um, unless you'd like to see another demo of something else. Um, I, I don't really have much I can go into other than, I guess, composition, but that would require me to actually go back and think about it. Um, it it's not happy with Photoshop, man. <laughs>